Hello. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see. Okay, good. Yeah, this night, um, we are still on the techniques in um, business analysis. And what we are going to be looking at is the epic list. So all these techniques we, are, we have been treating, they are very important. That's why I'm taking my time and I'm not skipping anyone. So, because these are things you certainly limit during the journey. So, we are going to be talking about epic lists and other techniques. Epic list is an agile, is, is within agile methodology, agile project management. An agile epic is a body of work that can be broken down into specific tasks called user stories based on the need through requests of customers or end users. So, epic list is a requirement at high level. What do we mean by high level? High level is a requirement that is within a very big state, within a very unbroken state, is a chunk of requirement <coughs> that can be broken down into little, little requirements or into little, little features. So that what we called epic list. So if you are working on a solution like e-commerce solution, these are list of epics. Like a product is an epic because on that product, we can have little, little pictures, little, little features on the product like product by, uh, catalog, product page, and a lot of them. Under users, we have so many users. We can have customers, we can have employees, and, and the rest of them. Under checkout, we have so many small, small features under checkout, like um, Pricing, stock, uh, payment system, uh, payment gateways, all these things can come under checkout. Then under promotion, we have, we have a lot of advertisement and a lot of them that comes under promotion. We have other management, we have search navigation. These are all of them are all these they are still in their high level state. They are not in low level, meaning that they, they are not broken down. And we, before we can work on them, we need to break them down into little, little features that um, developers can work on. So that's why I call them epic or high level. These are different stems, you know. In general, project um, project management, like um, waterfall, they call this high level requirement. But in agile methodology, we call it epic. Epic. So. 
let me um, clarify it a bit. From this epic, this is um, a backlog. So under this epic, which is high level, we have other smaller features under epic, which is under product, we have product management and so many others. Then we have um, performance, we have other uh, features under performance. So we keep on breaking them down under smaller, smaller features so that the developers can work on them. I'm going to um, use a template to explain this more so that we can uh, understand it the more. So looking at this, um, this is an e-commerce uh, project management template. So this is the epic here, this epic I showed you. And this is the full backlog. Now, see products here. On that product, we have four, we have three features or user stories under this uh, epic. Then you see user here, we have two users. Then under checkout, we have pricing, we have stock, we have cart, we have shipping, we have payment. We have other fulfillment and uh, checkout. This is uh, under checkout. On the front end, we have registration and login. We have a product description page, that is PDP. We have um, my account page. We have my company page. We have content page. We have store location and we have language so let, this is on the front end so that is how we broke down epics so understand epics as the main category in um, agile methodology and user stories will become subcategories so this is um, <clears throat> what we call epic we're going to be using doing this um, very soon or once you become a full-fledged project uh, business analyst find out that you'll be hearing this uh, very often within the profession so Let me analyze it a bit once more. This is a front end. And under this front end, the whole thing we are seeing like this, the whole page we are seeing with what we call front end. Then we have small, small features under this front end, which is this um, login. Hello. So then we have home page. We have a product page like this is a product page and if we go down we have company page 
these are so many pages within this uh, front end. All these most more these other pages we want to call user stories under this front end. Then we have um, a checkout under this. Once you add a product to cart. Is we say proceed to checkout. Checkout is a process of um, fulfilling your order and making payments. So checkout here is an epic that can be broken down into little user stories. And now once you do you, you proceed to checkout, you see. See cart, you see shopping, you see shipping um, information, you see delivery, you see payment. All these small, small features like shipping, delivery, they all of them are under checkout. So this is uh, this is it for now. Just this is the the only way we can practically understand what epic means. So like I said, is a high level requirement in agile methodology. Then while I was talking about Epic, I was talking about the small, small features on the Epic, which we call user stories. <clears throat> user stories are a requirement for any functionality or features which is written down in one or two line and the maximum of five lines so user story we call it user because you tell a story about what a user want to achieve with that particular piece of feature or piece of software because all this application we see any little feature we see is a little software that is developed that is attached all are ties to the big software. So we we'll call it unit of software. It's a small, is a small, uh, is the smallest unit of software in an application. So user story is what the user, what do you think user can um, achieve with this piece of software? Call it user story. That's where the user story comes. We tend to paint a picture of what a user can achieve with this piece of software. So that developers will put users in mind while developing it, knowing that what they are working on is trying to get the exact picture of what the users are going to do, not what they, the developers want or what the, the, the company wants but what the users want. So this is um, an example of a user story. And like I said, it can be written in a maximum of five lines. And looking at this, we have one, number one, two, and three. Now, as a WhatsApp user, that's how to write user story. So if you want to develop a piece of software or a piece of feature you want to add in WhatsApp, like Mark Zuckerberg, the owner of um, Facebook, want to add another feature in uh, WhatsApp because he owns WhatsApp. 
is going to put us in mind what do we want to achieve with this uh, WhatsApp, this little feature is trying to produce. So the way he's going to be writing it is, as a WhatsApp user, I want a camera icon in the chat right box to capture and send pictures so that I can click and share my pictures with my friends. So let me see if I can open my WhatsApp here. So let, let me show you this particular user story that I'm discussing now. Can you see my my page? Okay. So now. It doesn't, um, this is, um, a web. It's not here in this uh, web, web, um, app. is not but if you are there let me see i want to i want this thing to, to come up let me see if i can if i can do it this way Uh, still not. It's only on the mobile application. It's not here in the web application of WhatsApp. So, but if you open your WhatsApp, Yes. So can you see my page? Hello. I'm talking to someone. Yes, I can see the, I can see the page. Can you see the WhatsApp? This WhatsApp um Yes, yes, sir. Yes, can we you, can. 
can you see this uh, the the icon here this photo icon yes sir so this is the this is the user story i'm talking about this you have seen here this picture icon is a user story the purpose of this user story is that once you click on it it will help you to upload a picture from your phone and share it with your friends or whoever you want to share with this is what we call user story this is the user story i'm trying to illustrate or explain so i want you to see it so so as a whatsapp user i want a camera icon in the chat right box to capture and send pictures so that i can click and share my pictures with my friends so this particular user story is the user story that is used to develop that picture icon you are seeing and after user story there's what we call acceptance criteria acceptance criteria is a set of accepted accepted, uh, accepted condition or business rule which is which the functionality or the feature should satisfy and meet in order to be accepted by the product owner or the stakeholders so this particular was a user story must have a standard for us to accept it as a product owner or a stakeholder if you guys the development team are working to produce this for us responding to that um, whatsapp we develop this particular accepted acceptance criteria given that i'm chatting with a friend and i should be able to capture a picture when i click on the picture icon on my whatsapp I should be able to share the image with my friend. So that is the condition here. If a developer develops that uh, feature, which is user story, and it looks there, it looks beautiful, but it cannot perform this function, is useless. It must perform this function. It must be able, a, a user must be able to use it to share, capture and share picture before it can be accepted. So the rule is that the user story defines the requirement for any functionality or feature and acceptance criteria defines the definition of done for the user story to be accepted or the requirement. So the definition of done means that this particular user story meets the acceptance criteria. All these things are technical jargons within agile methodology. So that is that. So, then, we have um, epic user story map. So when you are planning your work, you are trying to develop a software. After developing, um, after listing your epic and user stories, it will be very good if you map them out in a map like this so that the developers will see it very clearly where each user story is falling in a diagram not just in a table but in a diagram like this 
as a use as a as a as a business analyst, almost everything you do, you show it in a diagram. That is the standard. Almost everything you must show a diagram to illustrate it. So this example is an online shopping store. So the epic here, which is on top, is the search for item, add to cart, which is shopping cart, login, and pay for item. So under this search, we have so many user stories here, and they are search by keyword. By keyword means that you type the, the keyword in the search bar and click, you will go and uh, query the system and bring any, any um, product that is related to that particular keyword that you use to query the, the application. Then search by category. Then you see categories. You click the category, you bring all the categories, and then you select categories and search. And search by cost. You see so many applications, they will show you the price range. So once you want to search for a product, for instead of you trying to navigate all the application, just select the price range, your budget. Once you select your price range or within the budget, to bring all the products that are within the price range so that you won't waste time looking for what you cannot afford. So on that cart, here you can see add item to cart, view item in cart. All these are different functionalities. Adding to cart, there is a, a process to add to cart. To view item, in, there is a process. To remove item from cart, there is a process. And to increase item quantity in cart, there is a process. All of them are user story under this. Then login. To login, you create an account, sign in in existing, or modify your details. Then pay for item, add payment detail, or modify all these things. So you, you map them here. And anybody looking at it like this, will not struggle. You will not say you don't understand this. As long as you are a developer or a business analyst or as a project manager, there is no way you cannot understand this. Even the stakeholders who doesn't have anything more, who doesn't have much knowledge about e-commerce, seeing this will understand this. So you make things to be easier for everybody as a business analyst to bridge the gap between the, the, the developers and the stakeholders, which are requirements. You have to de define the requirements, the way the user, the, the developers will understand it. You still need to define it the way the stakeholders and other users will understand it. So if you have any question, then let's take some question before we continue. Okay, good. No question. Now, the next thing we are going to look at is use case, use case diagram as use cases. It's another very good uh, technique which you cannot, um, you can't run away from as a business analyst. You find out everything you do is diagram. You keep on digesting your requirements so that everybody can understand. So you even have to use actors to break down your diagram. So in this, this is online shopping system. So 
use case diagram, the piece users possible interaction with a system. A use case shows various use cases and different types of uh, users within a system. Looking at this online shopping system, although it's not developed, but with this diagram, we know what everybody can do here. And we know the key players here. These key players, what we call them are actors within this system. So we know what all the actors can do here. The first actor here is the customer. The customer can view item. The customer can make purchase and the customer can log in. And the customer can equally um, complete checkout. Then we have uh, the admin here. The admin can view item. And uh, the admin here can complete checkout. And then the admin can log in as well. Then we have identity provider. Identity provider got only to capacity here. The person can only view item and again complete checkout. Then we we'll have the credit payment system. They can only work within the completion of checkout where they will receive the payment on behalf of this, their online client and such person again is here which is paypal they can only work on collecting payments on behalf of the client which is the system that's how we use use case diagram to illustrate or give more clarity when we are trying to this um describe the capacity of the solution to the stakeholders. This is a very simple use case. When you start progressing, you start seeing more complex use cases. Almost in everything you do, there is a way they use it. There is a way users use it. And um, there is a uh, people that makes use of that system. You need to identify all of them. If it's um, online, if it's a school, is um, any application, you must have use cases. And you can do that, describe them using use case diagram. So these are part of the things we're going to be doing with our, this in draw.io demo. Like when I was telling you that you need to know how to be very, comfortable with all these drawing applications. These are the things. Then after this, we have another drawing activity here. And this is what we call the wireframing. It's still a technique. The wireframe is a simple diagram that represents the skeleton of a website or application the user interface and core functionalities. We use wireframe to draw the skeleton of the, 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 the application you are trying to develop. For the developers to have a feel of what they are going to work on. And if equally the 
stakeholders to have a feel of what they are going to expect. So these are things. We are going to draw these. We're going to draw these things, but I'm going to leave this one for the work um, during work as um, placement. It's some of the things we are going to be drawing as well. So. All these things, they are not difficult. If you, if you know how to use the, the softwares, they are very easy. So that's why I keep urging you to go and play around with all those drawing applications. Do you have any questions? Okay. Then the next thing we are going to look here is what we called software testing. Is still a technique in um, business analysis, and is the duty of the business analyst to perform a test on a software that you design. After developing the the software by the developers, you need to perform series of tests before this particular software will be deployed from the development mode to the production mode. So, <clears throat> so we are going to be looking at what is testing, why testing is important, goal, of testing, when to conduct testing, and the types of testing. Software testing are a set of activities intend to find bug within a software, as well as validate and verify the software, that the software meets the business requirement and need as designed. After developing a software, there is a, we find out there is every tendency that there must be errors somewhere within the software. Just like everything we do, even the food we cook. After cooking food, we find out that there's no way you can cook food and, and the food will be 100% okay. When the food is a bit salty, that is bog in that food. And when the food is uh, so spicy, that is bog in that food. And when there is not enough oil in the food, it's a bog. And when the soup is water, that is a bog. So it's just the same thing in software even in fashion design, they, it'd be very difficult for a tailor to sew a cloth finish and you see fine small, small, either the tailor didn't put the, the, the button or the zip is not good or the weaving is not the way it should. So all these things are bog. Bog is a defect is an error that causes an incorrect or unintended result. That's just the simple definition of bulk.
importance of software testing. Defect in software development result to the following problems. When there is defect, it costs money, it frustrates the users, it extends the, uh, the project time. It is very important to conduct a series of tests to avoid such problems. Goals of software testing. One is for verification, and another one is for validation. You verify the software is built as designed according to the specification outlined. We have a specification on how this particular software is going to be developed. So after developing the software, we need to verify that it's within the specification. That's what we call verification in software testing. So, and when you do the verification, we are looking at to find out the presence of defects. It helps to reduce the probability of bug remaining in software at the time of launch. So it's, it's very difficult for a software to be bug free, but at least 90% bug free. That's what we are looking at. When a software, at times we see some software, once you click them, they go pyong, become fast. But some software, they cannot, um, you find out that they become slow. So there's a lot of things. You keep on um, checking for bugs, you keep on, keep on improving on the software. So that is how you manage software. Even Facebook, they are still bug in Facebook. If they tell you the amount of bug, they, 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 they keep fixing every day, you won't believe it. Then you have validation. When you are developing a software, there is a problem you have in mind that you want to use that software to solve. And that is the business need. So after building the software, you need to test to make sure that that software solve the problem that is originally uh, the software is intended for. That you can solve that particular problem, that business need. After building the software, the software can be working but if it doesn't solve that business need, then um, there is a problem. So you need to verify that it meets the specification outline and again, that it meets the business need. So these are the things you do. So when you are doing validation, you confirm the intended users can actually use the software as designed. Just like I said in WhatsApp image icon. After building that software and the user cannot use it to shape 
images to friends and families and then you know that it does not meet the requirement. So these are the main thing why we do software testing. So when do we conduct this test? Under waterfall, you can see from this diagram where the testing fall in. After requirement analysis, requirement garden analysis and requirement design, you do your development where the developers come in. At this point, requirement is the, the business analyst. You do that. And then requirement design, you the business analyst. And then under development, developers step into the project and start developing. And after developing, you the business analyst, you step in again to conduct tests to make sure that this thing you designed here is what these people developed here. And when you conduct this test, and it's actually what you designed that they develop, then you deploy. And after deployment, the next thing is maintenance. That's how the sequence, and that's where the testing comes in. But in agile methodology, you test every small piece of software you develop. So where does the software, the, the development come? From this analysis, you do analysis, you do design, then you implement your test within the implementation. As they are building it, you are testing. So within the implementation, you're conducting the test. But here, you don't, you don't test when they are developing. When they finish developing, you conduct tests. But here, both testing and the development goes hand in hand within. So immediately they finish that, you do the testing and deploy. You come back again and start cycling. Then types of testing. We have unit testing. This is the first step of testing to test as each component is completed. We call it unit testing because in Agile, we develop in unit by unit. So when every unit is developed, you test that small unit. And then you, call, you start another component or another unit, which is testing the user stories. Every time you finish developing the user story, you test it. Then we have integration testing. Know that they develop this thing in unit by unit. And after developing the units by unit, then you pull it together. All these components, all these units, you put them together into one big component or one big system. So when you pull all these components together, you need to test that large uh, component to make sure when you pull it, it's now it become it's no longer small unit, it becomes a large unit. You need to test that, make sure that all of them uh, have uh, compatibility and they are working well as a one big body. So once you do that, because at times when you develop all these small, small units, you fix all of them together, you find a crack find out that some of them doesn't, they don't match. You must find a way to fix the bug and they correct all the incompatibilities. So that's why you test for 
call it integration testing because we are integrating smaller units together. We have system testing. The last chance for the project team to verify a software. Validate software meet the business requirement. So once you finish building your unit, integrating it together, and there is a thing that is integrated, then it's time to use the system as to, to perform a work within the development environment. Once you can develop, once you can produce or execute the work, being the reason why it's uh, developed, then you know that uh, you have finished your work within the development environment. Because all these things, that, all these series of tests is going on between you, the business analysts, and the developers. So when you conduct these three testing, the next thing is to call in the stakeholders or the user to come and perform their own test. And when they come in to perform that test, is none of you within this development unit that will do it. it is going to be the end user that is going to perform this test is going to use it the way an end user is supposed to use the software once the end user can use the software successfully to perform a task or a function then means that the software is now ready for deployment to the production environment so and then after then we have regression testing because most of the times i'll say there are times not most of the times are times after performing this uh uat that user acceptance testing find out there is a bug that this particular uh this thing or even within any of these tests not only on a uat but within any of these tests once you conduct a test within this area and there is a bug you need to go back for fixing and after fixing you must retest the system and that's what we call regression testing testing again after fixing a bug that will call regression testing to make sure that the fixture because at times you go you try to fix a bug and you even cause a larger problem within the software so that's why you need to conduct tests to make sure that everything is working you just like somebody who is sick you've gone to the hospital for treatment there is every possibility that if you are not careful in the, within the hospital environment, you might go home carrying another disease. So what they are saying here is that although you've gone to the hospital to, to check up yourself or treat yourself, after treating yourself and you feel that everything is well, and you still need to carry another test within the hospital to make sure that we are totally healthy that we are not carrying another sickness too. That is the importance of this regression testing. If you have any question, you chip in or we crack on. Good evening, Mr. Charles. I'm listening. Okay, I want to know if uh, these types of testing, if it can be used in both the waterfall and the agile methodology. Yes, you need to test all your all your um, applications. Like if you see the testing, I show where the testing can be performed, but is the same testing. You test in a waterfall. That is the same testing you do in um, within um, agile 
methodology. Looking at, um, at this, uh, uh, this um, here, this is, you can see this arrow, this is where you do the testing. All these three testing must be performed here. Okay. And all this, all the, it's four testing. Yeah, four testing. You need this, 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 you know. The only thing here, because even within this um, waterfall, they still integrate their system. Mind you that all the system, all the things that they are building, they still fix things together. It's just that the difference between these is that they cannot deploy small features. It must finish everything before it goes to the market. That doesn't mean that their own um, uh, application is not uh, built in small pieces. Every software is built in small pieces. Every so just like pass. Every, all these small, small pieces, they are pass. If it's like a WhatsApp app, WhatsApp application, all these small, small features are parts or just like parts of this um, application, just like a car, which is one body, have so many motor parts that makes up this big motor. So all these features, whether in waterfall or whether in, they are all parts, but the only difference is that in agile methodology, they made it in such a way that even if um, they as, as 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 soon as the car have got four tires and an engine and the place to sit down, whether they, maybe they have not put the roof of the car, you can start driving the car. The main purpose is for the car to take you to from one destination to another destination. Maybe as you are using the car, over time they will start putting the roof in, and over time they will start um, putting other thing, painting the car. You can be using the car and they will still be building on the car. It's just like someone who is building a house. Immediately you roof the house, meaning that the, the water cannot uh, uh, fall on top of you and your family. You pack your thing and go to your house. As the house is there, you, you, you living in the house, you put the, the windows. You, all of us, most, uh, let me not say all of us, most of us, we came from uh, developing environments or low economy environment where you can see people living in their house and the house is not uh, fully completed. But you keep on building the house gradually, gradually, gradually living in the house till the house becomes so beautiful. But in water, in, in waterfall, if you are building a house, you cannot move into that house until you finish everything, paint it, and then commission the house. But that doesn't mean you have, why I'm trying to say this because of this um, unit testing, because it's not only in uh, agile that will have units. But in uh, the, the, the difference between Agile and Waterfall is that Agile units, you can just produce um, a tire and send the tire into this and they'll, into the can, they'll start using it. Once you produce the, the so it's in any one you produce, you send it to the hole and people start using it. So that is it. So, all these tests will still conduct it, whether waterfall or agile. Are you, satis are you satisfied? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The Let's finish this. Let me just know that we are done with the, the techniques. And next time we are looking at the methodologies. So.
Now, what we have here is um, project closure reports. When you finish your testing and everything works well, the next thing is to write a report. Although as a business analyst, there is one thing you need to do within before it was it's part of the closure because it's the duty of the project manager to write the report. But the business analyst, you write the acceptance report. Accept, you just fill acceptance form where the either the we are going to look at the acceptance uh, within this. Um, when we are going to do this, it's not captured yet. The acceptance form is you give it to the the client or the project sponsor to fill a form for you to show that he's happy with your project and the project can then be closed because the project have gone through all the tests and everything is fine, but it's a very simple process. It's just a kind of a validation, end of the, or the success of the um, project validation to validate that the stakeholder who owns or who initiated that the project is happy after the testing that everything is okay. Once the stakeholder gives you a go ahead order that is happy with the work, then the project manager will step in and uh, write the reports, you know? So, and once the report is done, then means that the project is completed and everybody can go. Although at times there's what we call the um, post-implementation review. After writing the report, we might well, uh, come together again as a team to write some reports how, because once the project is deployed, you can doesn't have any hand in that project again. But you can write end project report where um, post implementation review, where you give experts opinion on the way to manage that pro uh, particular software going forward. So, but the main thing here is. Uh, to write the closure report, which captured everything within the project, the sources and the, the benefits, the shortfall within the project. Here you see the description and the uh, financial benefits, all the deliverables here, describe all the deliverables, the, describe all the benefits from the, the, the end user is going to, or the, the, the stakeholders are going to realize from this project. And then control in place, so in this area, you might use this area to even capture the <clears throat> capture the post implementation review. So and once all these areas are captured and the relevant authorities here within this signature, everybody, all the relevant authorities, which is the project leader, the project manager, the project sponsor, the process owner and financial advisor, 
everybody will sign this document and date it. And once this is signed and documented, then it means that the project has successfully come to an end. And it's always, <clears throat> it's always difficult to reach this process because most projects along the line get crashed. Most of them don't get here. So once you get to this point of writing the closure report, you should be a big celebration for you and your team. So these are the various techniques you need to apply while trying to um, deliver a piece of software or solution to your client or your organization. So, but all these things will come live when we start doing our work in real life, where then we will start producing all these documents. It's no longer been maybe me showing you the document, you look at it, but you are going to be producing it against the project we are working on as a team. So that is it. Do you have any question? I, I don't have. Okay. So you see why I I'm pairing project management and business analysis together because you see they have a lot of things in common, but there is few areas where they differ. So the point here is to weave everything together and it will give you a thorough understanding about managing a project from different perspective because it's all about looking at the project from different angle. So. so if you don't have any questions, tomorrow we'll continue and we'll be looking at finishing this tomorrow so that um, you have time to uh, do your assignment and then we'll start working. The next week, we'll start working, planning towards our next journey within this uh, program. So I can see that time has flied. We are almost one month stuck here together and then we are going to be stuck in here together within the next three months and i hope you guys are enjoying it it's real yeah Ab absolutely okay so i wish everybody good night and see you here tomorrow again Good night. Yeah. Good night.